Alors, je vais essayer de me souvenir de tout ce que j'ai à dire. Je vous avoue que je suis un peu stressée de parler devant vous. Ah, en anglais. Sorry. I'm saying I'm really stressed up to, to, um, to talk. Last time I had to talk in public, for some reason, I had a brain freeze, which had never happened to me. So, I'm a stressed up. And um, I'm going to try to remember everything I want to talk about. Um, when Benoit called me, I was finishing uh, a one year and a half long artist residency, which is a very uh, long residency. Most of the time, there are like three or four months, and uh, this one had been extremely exhausting, and I was really, really happy to have this phone call because Benoit was asking me kind of to, in some, in some way to process the those experiences of artist residencies and like the politics that are imply in, implicated in in them and um, I was really ready to to reflect on those things so the the things I'm going to show you today are more are going to be about those conditions in which uh, artists are uh, um, working and I'll, I'll show you some of my work to uh, to talk about that, but as opposed to uh, giving you a lecture about my work. Um, so, and uh, I worked, I had the chance, I'm French American, so I worked on both sides of both continents and they're extremely different. And uh, so I, my, my path is I studied uh, art in France and then I went to the United States and studied uh, landscape uh, design a few years further and that's why landscape is very is the 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 line the thread in my work how people relate to the landscape and in its different aspects um, the first thing I'm showing you is also in Nevada and I was uh, um, it's it, this kind of my first piece in United States and the main difference in working in United States versus uh, France, which is the European context I know the most, is of course the funding. <laughs> in the United States, um, funding is almost non-existent. Especially in the Bay Area, that's supposed to have like the highest per capita artist, which is where I live, higher than New York and higher than LA, which makes every little grant like super competitive. And um, yeah, so you work out of necessity as opposed to um, other things. So this first uh, uh, video documentary is in Nevada in a town called Hawthorne. I don't know if you know it, but Hawthorne is the second uh, largest world ammunition depot and they have a celebration that's called uh, Armed Forces Day. And it's a town that has only 5,000 people. So it's a small town. It has a Safeway, which is uh, a Safeway is like a grocery store that implies that it's a food desert because the groceries you can get in it are only corporate groceries. You c probably can't get organic anything. There's a casino that's full and very active. And there's, um, there's Armed Forces Day. What you're <laughs> seeing, <laughs> which is the yearly event, what you're seeing is, um, it was, I went there in 2002, and uh, I, I don't know if you re recognize what scene this is trying to match. It's like the poses of Ground Zero, that image of Ground Zero that went, you know, on the media everywhere. And as a as a parade, they had enacted this pose. Um, what was interesting to me is that in that town, because they had so much uh, military supplies, they use it for everything they do. <laughs> so it's everywhere. On Armed Forces Day, you can shop for weapons. Uh, this is the military base. The cinema is a, a, a military recycled a dome. This is a Miss Hawthorne on a Hummer, <laughs> a military Hummer. And this is the high school mascot, which is a, a rocket. <laughs> so it's present everywhere. And um, the way we did it with no funding is like I found a friend with a car and we drove all the way there and we filmed people, slept in our car, and we did interviews. And in the interviews, people are like, oh no, we're a really peaceful town, nothing ever happens. Oh, except last month, the mayor, the Sheriff's son shot 
shot himself and it's like a 10 year old or something so it's just really kind of awkward little town but i wanted to start with this project because it's kind of my favorite uh, starting over there i should do it again because also i did it in 2002 and um technology has evolved so much so those are mini dvs dvds you know technology that doesn't even exist anymore so um Parallel to that, another documentation I was doing is on uh, green activism in the urban context of the Bay Area. And also, well, this is a project that, in my opinion, didn't age very well because those things became so documented later. But I felt like when I was doing it, I felt like I felt necessary to voice what was going on. And this is like a humanor, uh, a humanor system within the urban context, which is radical in the United States context where uh, in certain places you can get a ticket if you don't mow your lawn, et cetera, et cetera. This is a pedal wash machine, also in Oakland. And like it's water filtering systems and chickens and all those things, but those are, a little while ago and this is i think the last project oh no um this is um a project i did uh also with super little funding but with a whole uh, uh group of people this is a seed library that we built uh, uh in a permaculture farm at the heart of san francisco the permaculture farm was very short-lived um, I did the project is all recycled and there was a need for the seed library. I mean, saving seeds in the United States is very political, of course, because of Monsanto, etc. And uh, the idea is to get heirloom seeds that are really, uh, that will, that are perfect for our area, of course, and all the microclimates. Uh, uh, around the bay, I think there's like 25 just in the bay area. So it's a it function as a with an honor system. Like you can take all the seeds you want. The idea is you bring back seeds at the end of the season. And I did not activate it. I built it in the farm. And for me, it's a complex piece because I don't think it's it's complicated. Is it an art piece or is it not? Or like even the status of this piece is complicated for me. The funding I use the funding I, I there is there are a little bit of grants. There's the San Francisco Art Commission grant, which is the equivalent of uh, um, I mean there's it's I don't know there's the equivalent in, in France. I, I forgot the name, but I use like parts of that <coughs> fund to do this piece, working with. Um, the recology, which is the dump to get materials, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a still from a, a video, and this was done in a residency in San Francisco, and it's a residency that's kind of uh, singular because it is in the, the dump of San Francisco. So the particularities of that residency is they expect you to only work with the material there. Um, I did, but the fav my favorite thing I did in that residency was uh, do this little di documentary on a falconeer. The issue at the dump is there's a lot of uh, seagulls that come and eat the um, the trash and they kill themselves because they ingurgitate too much and then it uh, kind of explodes their system. So there's a falconeer that uh, lives in his car and he flies the falcons uh, every single day. But he was kind of fascinating to me because he he uh, he drives and he, so you you can kind of see in the back all the white stuff is kind of bird crap and his car smelled horrible and he lived with those birds and it was really it was really weird but I don't know it's kind of the systems that have to be built to remedy and the trash and I don't know it's it's complex it raises a lot of and it pulls a lot of strings, that little, that little story. And the falcons are really cute. There was an ox too. Okay, so the next... Uh, sorry. 
the um, then I started working in France because I finally understood that there was tons of funding in France which I didn't know before and uh, this is the first the first residency I did in France was was uh, really singular it was in in the Pyrenees and the model was for one week the artist there was four or five artists from Catalonia and France and for one week long we listened to conferences on how climate um, how um, global warming was affecting the Pyrenees like all the different shifts like the trees the geology history of the Pyrenees like the fact that there had not been trees on the Pyrenees for a really long time because the mining was done on site of course so they were like cutting all the trees on site to like melt the, the metal and like contrary to what we could assume like there's no trees for like centuries as since like human had discovered how to make metal I don't know lots t tons of information like that and the the I was placed in Ariège and Ariège is um, the poorest department of France and I'm mentioning it because it's a place where I ended up going back so many times to work. Um, and the, the, when I was there, I made a, a, the first work, on, it was called Ariège Against the Machine, because it's a porous department, but it's the <coughs> department that has the most uh, um, organic farming. And it had the most, at the last elections, it had the most uh, extreme uh, left voting. Um, and the story I heard when I got there was that they had tried to build a McDonald's and it had been burnt down. So I thought, that's my people, I have to stay around here. So I ended up working there many times. And um, so I, I did a few residencies there. And this, I'm gonna show you a, a little piece I did the second time I went there. And um, the people that had ho hosted me the first time, they financially got um, funding to have me come again. And I was working with a little museum of that region and they gave me an apartment on top of a mountain. <laughs> and I, it was winter and the next day after I got there, it snowed. I'm not familiar with snow at all. I didn't, I, don't, I just don't know it. And uh, so it was not exactly my idea of working there but that's just the way they did it because because it was a, the muse it was a museum of uh, patrimoine comment dit ça? heritage kind of so it was kind of a specific context they didn't tell me what they wanted but they threw me in this town and and uh, and that that was that was strange so this is what i did this is a five minute piece of a, a documentary that's maybe one hour and 15 minutes Subtitle. It's in French, but it's subtitle. <coughs> la Corneille. La Corneille. Oui, pas la Corneille de Plaine. Eh. Ça n'a rien à voir avec les Corneilles qui sont ici à la montagne. Mais c'est très bon, très fin. Sûrement, si vous tombez sur une vieille, c'est un peu dur. C'est comme si vous. Eh. Les, les pinceaux, des rouges gorges quelques grives, ça, ça valait la peine parce que c'est plus gros. Enfin, vous savez, pour qu'on ne connaissait pas trop les noms, des châteaux peut-être, c'était des oiseaux du de pays. J'ai mangé du, du merle, j'ai mangé... J'ai mangé... Du merle, j'ai mangé... Qu'est-ce que j'ai mangé Du merle. J'ai mangé du hibou. Je ne sais pas comment ça s'appelle en français. Du hibou, quoi. Mais du, peu, du jeune, hein. du nid. Mais c'est bon, hein. Ces oiseaux, ils étaient soigneusement nettoyés, plumés, tout ça. Et puis ils mangeaient frit. Les petits oiseaux, il y en avait qui les mangeaient tout entier. Sauf les pâtes, peut-être, je veux dire. Mais les petits, alors, et, et, surtout s'ils étaient dans les nids. Maintenant, les oiseaux, ça arrivait qu'on les fasse à la broche. Ça, on les faisait à la, à la broche. Elle est là, la broche. Les petits oiseaux, du tombe de l'église. Mais il y en avait. Il y en a. 
Mais à l'époque, par contre, ils vendaient les, les pots qui vendaient très cher. Mais de, ils les vendaient au marché à Saint-Gilon, à la foire. Et c'est des fouleurs, sûrement. Puis ça partait dans les, à des fichiers des fouleurs. À l'époque, une peau de martre ou un truc comme ça, les, les, gars, les vieux d'ici vous disaient, avec une peau de martre, ils se, ils, ils se payaient, si vous voulez, ça valait le prix d'un fût de vin, d'un fût, fût assez important. Vous voyez que ça avait de la valeur. Oh, le bléon a tapé dans le pied, hein? parce qu'il venait au maïs. Il, il mangeait beaucoup de maïs, le bléon. Et alors, on le chopait, et puis, euh, c'était bon à manger. Mais il fallait le mettre suspendu à, à la belle étoile, toute une nuit, pour lui faire perdre de l'odeur. Hein? Ah, le blaireau, il y en avait aussi. Elle se vendait la peau du blaireau. Hein? Le blaireau, il fallait que c'est bon à manger. Ben, tout ça. Ce que j'ai mangé, bon, c'est dans l'armée du Hélissor. C'est Estra. Il y a la suite qui est mangée la couleur. Je dire que c'est très bon. Il a coupé la tête la, de la peau. Je veux dire que c'est comme moi dans le lever, et je l'ai mangé. Un bien, et je l'ai connu très peu, moi. J'étais jeune, quand j'allais au catégisme. Et on vient de vous porter un ours. C'est le dernier ours, d'ailleurs, qui avait été tué au-dessus de Luchon, de Luchon, dans la vallée du Lys. Au-dessus de Luchon. Alors le, le, le chef de lieu, moi je ne te veux pas me faire ça. Alors il me dit, oh, vous voulez le, tu veux le goûter Ah mais j'ai dit, moi je veux le goûter. En un jour, il m'en a porté une tranche comme ça, de, de, de la cuisse, cet épisode. C'était délicieux, parce qu'on l'a mis à mariner un peu, c'était très bon. Et bien, les gens n'étaient pas écolos comme maintenant. En un jour, il a été vendu l'ours. Vous voyez un peu Et là, la mentalité de l'époque avait la mentalité de maintenant. Mais il y avait des ours en pagaille à l'époque. So it's a documentary on um, the... Um culinary landscape that disappeared. I don't know if you have the same one in the Alps or not, but um, so it's an inventory of, so what happened is like, I'm snowed in in this town of maybe 80 old people and I hear a story of someone eating a crow. So I started knocking on doors and trying to, I mean, it's hard to, you were talking about the people from the mountain, it's hard to uh, get them to open their door and accept me to film them talking about the badger they ate like 70 years ago so it was a, it was it was complicated to do but it turned out to be um so the the film is in different parts there's like the mammals there's the uh, for the fish and the birds and what uh emerges from the film is um <coughs> Not only there's there's the animals, but then there's that fur, that whole fur story, like the fur markets uh, are, are are spoken about, and like the transformation of the landscape because there are no more fish. The fish are put uh, artificially there, and then there's a talking about the mining that was happening around that polluted the rivers because the mines closed and all the chemicals involved in mining stayed on the site and like leached eventually in the ground. Da, da, da. So. Um, So yeah, so it's kind of like the history of, of the landscape in the in the 20th century that emerges from the film. Uh, I think artists 
learn through making things as opposed to theory. And uh, this was kind of the piece that made me go to the archives and see like if I could cross uh, the things I found with anything they had. And I found some propaganda flyers saying like, you got to kill the otters because they're bothering da, da, da. And now there's like two otters left and they're super protected, etc. So there were some things, but they didn't, they didn't have the thing. But um, what I mean by art is learning by doing things is it's at that time that I started reading people like Artog or Bifo that talk about the transitional times that time that we're going through now and the transitional times that occurred before from modern to atomized or from me medieval to um, to modern. Um, and and with those time changes, like the desire to capture uh, what is disappearing. <coughs> Because, like, of course, we're artists working with archives. There's a there's a lot of us. But okay. And so Ayesh is a place I uh, ended up going back many times. And another uh, film I did I will just get going is uh, having worked on uh, green anarchism uh, m many times over. Uh, And, and, and of course, people living off the grid uh, intentionally, uh, something that was a core problem in, in those contexts was water. So, and, and that problem being kind of um, um, the most, I mean, I, I decided to make a, 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 a film called Wash on uh, the bathing ri ritual when, you don't, when you're living off the grid. So this is this is what this is. This is also a pretty long film because um, because it takes time to uh, warm water if you're living off the grid, and I didn't want to chop chop down that uh, that aspect. But I will accelerate a little bit the process. By the time the water is hot, it's nighttime, <laughs> and the whole family goes bathing. <laughs> And this is like a bucket system. And I guess those were, these, this, these buckets were intentionally all destroyed in order to sell bathtubs and stuff at some point. They're super hard to find. And I wanted to talk about this film just because this is a project, for example, I could not find, uh, I could not find funding for. It was impossible to do. And I did it in the context of another residency where they were expecting and harassing us to, because there was an exhibition at the end of the residency and they really wanted, it was exactly like one of those sculpture parks. They had an event every summer and artists basically have to produce for that event. So we were kind of like, we were, we were harassed to produce for this thing. And um, I took the stipend and I went in a different part of France and in Ariège and I, where I filmed most, most of this. I've, I started that in New Mexico and so there's, there's both New Mexican sites and Ariège sites. And that's a project, yeah, super complicated and impossible to get funding for and then I, I sold it and it's part of the, the French national collection but it's, it was definitely a project that was I had to push for maybe two years. Plus, it's really complicated to find people living off the grid that want to be filmed naked in their bath, ba um, in their bathing situations. So this is another. Sorry, it's it's very long, so I'm gonna cut it short. Uh, I think. Uh. Well, this one, I'll just. This is a, another film on uh, that I also did in the in the context of a residency that I was expecting a spectacle, and where <coughs> I made this film instead that was not spectacular at all. But I just want to mention it because at some point you were talking about the um, the peasant, the glorious peasant, and this painting. So the, this film is about this painting. It's called the Plowing Lesson, and it's a painting that's all about. Um, uh, the virtues of the peasant, the peasant as the arm of God of Michelangelo, you can recognize it, but there's, and there's, it's, is, this is done during the period of the physiocrats, where, uh, 
this young um, bourgeois who's destined to industry has to also learn agriculture to have a balanced uh, view of the world. I thought it was funny because it was just during the um, during when the um, there was that crash of uh, Wall Street and thinking like thinking that and and people in Wall Street should study agriculture was entertaining to me. Anyway, um, this is a piece done for a sculpture park. And sculpture part for me is really um, problematic. This one, this one is okay, but I've I've worked quite a few times in in those settings, and for me, is the labeling like how do you call those pieces? Because sometimes you just want to call them like decoration for your park, you know? Like, is this an art piece? I don't think so. And and there are uh, in the town I studied, there are uh, artist collectives that. They they do production and they do spectacle and they will they will come to your town and they will do like a super site specific work. They'll work with your communities supposedly and they will create an event and leave and that's it. So uh, for me that's really problematic and that's why I'm really excited about this conversation that I think should happen in so many other places. Um, also, after our conversation, I kind of looked at all the. In France, it's very centralized when there's uh, when there's a when there's an um, of something available for artists, it's uh, centralized and uh, it's it's you can all see it on one website. You know, like every every opportunity art artist opportunity that uh, are occurring at one time, whether it's like teaching or any kind of intervention. And after we talked, I kind of went through them to see like the proportion of like. Essentially, well, of course, there's teaching, but the proportion essentially to uh, research to site-specific work, and in the past two years, there has been so much, so many opportunities because every little countryside town is wanting to have their their sculpture park or their summer event that's going to bring tourism, and as an artist, like it's. It's, uh, I mean, yes, you can completely have a career doing those things and be sustainable and be happy, but it's, uh, yeah, so it was pretty much like 95%, like with the 1%, 1% for the arts and those, uh, those various <coughs> events. Or like all those residencies that lead up to an exhibition that's also gonna cater to the to local community and I was also reading a little bit of like the the history of the Ministry of Culture and what happened is they realized that 50% uh, of the in the French context of uh, of the budget for art was going to Paris so they really made an effort to distribute it in the countryside hence all the appearance of all those uh, country uh, events and opening of art centers in order to decentralize culture that was too concentrated in Paris um, this piece is um, in Chamarand. Chamarand is a, a castle next to Paris. And it's a sculpture park. They collect art. It's a department that has a pretty big collection. Usually departments don't have collections. Regions do, but not departments. And uh, I, I propose historically there had been a French garden in front of the castle that's on top. So I proposed to have a French garden, but I worked with the botanist to identify species that would uh, feed the birds. And uh, so it's melliferous flowers and uh, plants that create seeds for the local species. And so this is what it looks like. It's pretty large. And this is what happens. It was, it was really satisfying to work with the land because you, you plow it. You seed it, and then it does. The sculpture happens by itself. So. Um, this is this is um, earlier this year. I was a finalist for um, for doing a proposal in a park, and that's also something we talked about with Benoit. Um, I proposed to turn the park. I, I had a, a kind of a really uh, kind of homeopathic proposal, but I. I wrote a little manifesto for it. The, the Jardin de Delis refers to Bosch's uh, Garden of Earthly Delights, but it was it was to turn the park into an edible park, and it would be uh, free. Like the, there was there was uh, volunteers of the uh, people take care of trees. They were willing to come and prune the trees, etc. 
and um, so those those are the species species that were over there, and this, those are all site analysis. What's the park? Um, it's a park in a little town called Obiet that was trying to get people to go there because they have nothing there. So I, don't know, I pitched pitched this edible garden. And then I received this letter. <laughs> and, oh, we can't really read it. But um, we were three finalists. And our pieces were, our pr proposals, our finalist proposal were going to be collected, or they are collected by the National Collection. So, um, but two of us, one of us, one of them got rejected, and two of us received a letter. And we were told <coughs> we would, we, uh, thank you for working but we really would like you to um, to make the piece more extraordinary monumental artistic mm. and uh, okay keeping in mind their sensational artists that they had invited previously <laughs> <laughs> then they had a pigeon house that we had to consider for a proposal and we had to work with the, the tree people, which I mentioned, which I wanted to work with. And how is, how are we gonna work with the population? So, you know, that was important. But, and, and the last one is like, how, uh, how will it sustain itself over time? But this letter kind of compiled every, the weight that bears on artists when they are working in the public space kind of every aspect, like uh, the educational aspect, the catering aspect, the, 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 the counting how many people you're gonna uh, imply in your project, the making the list, the keeping their emails so they can be spammed for like the 10 following years for everything that happens with the art center, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, um, and I didn't get it because I was too tired to com continue working on that. So you just replied? Well, I had written a manifesto. I had writ written a manifesto for this piece. I didn't want to the, to the piece to be spectacular. I wanted the piece to be functional, and I thought that was be, that was that was um, radical enough, you know. <laughs> but they didn't, which is fine. I don't want to work with them anyway at this point. Um, yeah. So your response was no, thank you. My response was, uh, no, what I did is I, 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 I closed the garden because I, I didn't like the way this was open. So I closed it and, uh, and then I sent them, I sent them old work. I was like, I was like, well, you want something big like this? Okay, you can have it. I'll make money off your proposal. And also they, their budget was not very big. So, you know, you, you, there's, it's, to do spectacular, I don't know, it's complicated. It's, I didn't, at that point, I didn't care. Plus I did that during my maternity break and I was tired. <laughs> I didn't want to do it anymore. But anyway, so this, off to another, another chapter. Uh, back in the United States, uh, I had at some point encountered this painting this uh, ceramic, this faience, it's called, it's a kind of ceramic, a French kind of ceramic with a, with a cooking that's special, special faience, it's like cooked at a thousand degrees or something Celsius. And um, there was this really short moment where the faienciers that were mostly working for patrons when the French uh, Revolution happened, they don't have a patron anymore, so they're they're painting the guillotine and they're pa painting all those things where they're kicking the butts of a priest and stuff. And at that point, I really wanted to work with ceramics. It was also during Occupy, and I was looking in the in in, in Chachkis where uh, where the French Revolution had uh, appear with the popular voice, and that was something I wanted to work on. And so I'm back in the United States and I have an exhibition in a, in, a, in a gallery. I have an award and back in the United States, no funding, of course. So, and um, I brainstorm with Jérôme Wang on like, how can I work with ceramics? And I don't know, somehow I end up in this clay factory. And 
I, I made a documentary on the clay factory, and I'm going to show you one minute and, and keep talking. It's This is only one compressed minute of a, a, of a maybe 10 minute documentary. All those scenes are much longer. But um, this is to compress the, the stone or crush it. Mix it. All the workers are Latino, of course. What mostly surprised me in this factory is clay was manufactured. I assumed clay came out of the ground, and it, it really didn't. It was completely made from stone uh, from, from A to Z. And um, all it, so this company not only made clay, but it made drilling mud. Drilling mud, their, their main, the main client of this Sacramento factory is the oil industry in the Central Valley of California that has a lot of uh, oil extraction and fracking. And also at that time, Northern California was, uh, well, Northern California is fracked, but there was a, there was a menace of fracking uh, in aromas right next to uh, Santa Cruz, which is really close to uh, San Francisco. And uh, the citizens, there was a citizen group that I met and they were starting to uh, contest that. So what, um, along this film, what I ended up doing is, so how that clay is used by the drilling industry is um, bentonite clay is has really a big uh, e expansion qualities. I don't know if you're familiar with drilling mud. No, it it's uh, injected in the wells. It coats the wells. It swells and it keeps um, the pollution of of uh, water tables. And so. There, then, then once it's uh, absorbed too many chemicals, the drilling mud is pulled out and it's changed and it's, it was thrown in the ocean for years and years and years and I guess a few years ago they stopped doing that and now they have to process it in California. There are states like Kansas where they have convinced the farmers that it was good for their crops. Um, that clay is fueled with chemicals, not only oil but everything they inject for fracking and different things. So I worked with the ceramics and we made a pot out of that clay. We got the clay from the geologist that worked in that factory and we made um, a pot in the tradition of uh, Native Americans in the south of California. There's only one pot. But the thing is bentonite clay, of course, it, <coughs> it retracts and it can't hold water. So it was the idea was to combine or juxtapose the first use of clay and the last use of clay where it, clay is not usable anymore. I showed this piece with um, a series of No Limit Tangere. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with the uh, Christ Gardener. I like to think it's, it's, it's No Limit Tangere means don't touch me and it's I guess Mary Madeline that and Jesus and um, the, she mistakes him for a gardener, but the, those uh, images only appear at a really short time in history at the transition from medieval to modern times where the cities are expanding because there's like colonization, there's goods that are brought back to Europe <coughs> and uh, so the cities are expanding and it's the beginning of the enclosed garden. It's also the beginning of representation of uh, landscape and like of course like Linnaeus, a lot of botanical discoveries, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I put a series on them, and my proposal was that they were kind of the green, green um, anarchists of the time, like wanting to represent Jesus with the shovel. But that's my proposal. I'm not an art historian. I can do what I want. <laughs> the, um, the next piece I will talk about is a... Uh, so after the documentary on uh, those animals, those disappeared uh, landscape, um, I was invited 
to do that year-long residency in an art center, art and design center called La Cuisine. La Cuisine is uh, means kitchen, of course, <laughs> and it's the uh, I guess it's the first um, art center dedicated to food in France that opened uh, earlier this year, and. Uh, so I, I still wanted to work with clay, and I and I I did work. It turns it turns out that um, farmers a lot of times in in the at least the southwest of France where I've done many residencies, farmers they work the land in the summertime and in the winter time they work the clay. So it's like two different uses <coughs> of the soil, which I, I I liked, and I should these along with a film on farming also in that region. But um, because I had just done this film on clay, I decided to work with local clay, which no potter does because it's too complicated. Why would you worry about the, the stuff in the clay when you can just buy clay? So we worked with a clay. I say we because I, I worked with a, with a ceramist. And uh, the clay we found, OK, and, the 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 place where the quarry the quarry the clay quarry was not accessible because the clay quarry was under the dump was under the cemetery mm -hmm. so the, there's there's no way although an old man who was having his uh, tomb dug offered me to find me clay but we didn't use this clay the clay we used was an industrial debris and there was a, a sand quarry, not very far, and they separate the sand from the clay, and so they have those huge quantities of clay they don't know what to do. So we used that clay, which had limited uh, elasticity, so we could only do certain shapes. Um, even though I was in a design center, I made very simple shapes. And, uh, and in the tradition, because there had been a tradition faience in that town, so it's a it's the, the 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 that center is the dedicated to food. So I decided to do a dinnerware. That's that's where the, the ceramics f fall in, and historically they had faience and on which they had uh, pastoral scenes depicted. So I decided to do contemporary pastoral scenes, which was also a problem with the mayor. For example, this super rue is like Migro here. It's like a supermarket. And the mayor was like, eh, maybe shouldn't do too many of those. Uh, this is like the protest against fracking before fracking was banned in France. Uh, industrial housing, graf graffitis, teenagers drinking next to graffitis. And, um, you know, the black trash cans that are everywhere. So it's um, I I too have a very uh, love and mostly hate relationship with the countryside and in this piece it kind of all came out I was really really tired there was a political change during the residency so not only there's all those expectations because it's a new art center because you have to count all the people you work with and like everything you have to come up with like things the kids could be doing in relation to your work etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But then during the middle of that residency, the, um, there's the elections and the opposite party was running against the art center. Like that was the campaign against the art center, so anyone. <laughs> so that was, that was a complicated moment. But in the scenes uh, depicted were, you know, there's the, the protest, um, against agro-business and the repression, even in the countryside. I kind of enjoyed working in the countryside as well because I also feel that all the, all the, all the globalization is also happening in the countryside. All the, all the relation to land, rather it's uh, off the grid, rather it's exploitation, everything happens in the country and that's exciting to me the perpetual celebration of, of World War I and World War II, which it's important, but they kind of neglect the fact that we're still like uh, committing genocides now, going to Mali and stuff, for example. Jardiland, for me, this is really important 
Jardiland in my and the and the piece I'm working on now is again on Jardiland. Jardiland determines the biodiversity of the future in uh, in France because they select the plants that are available on the market. So, you know, as in, in terms of representing what the rural uh, looks like, it seemed to me that that was a very important actor. This is the quarry. This is, uh, it feels like it feels like Switzerland kind of grew the same way France did, like in the 80s, like all the little towns all of a sudden have like an uh, industrial zone with all those same um, stores. These are the quantities of uh, animals killed by the local slaughterhouse. All the slaughtering is uh, centralized, and so I called the I called the slaughterhouse to know like how many uh, how many of everything was killed in that region. Nuclear power plants, cemeteries. Of course, there's like you know, of, I don't know if here it's the same, but aging population in the countryside and like lots of cemeteries, agro-business. And sometimes you understand, this is the faience that used to happen in that town. And the neighbor, one of the neighbors had told me about flying saucers coming in his garden and I painted it. And then I realized that historically there was the dragons. And I feel like probably there was a dragon story and like the ceramist painted it. Anyway, I felt like I solved that enigma. <coughs> and this is, uh, this is a piece I'm working on now, next week, it's the opening. And this is the second time I'm working in Bordeaux. And Bordeaux is a town that has, that needs the discussion that you're having here because it's the second time. If I, I went to school there, but it's, I've only worked there twice for two different biennales that they're trying to do. They're definitely trying to get on the map for art and they keep making horrific mistakes where they get all the art community really offended. Uh, they use, they definitely, for, for this year, they're trying to, um, there's this whole part of town where that nobody uh, uses it's more residential, and they're trying to they're trying to use artists for people to go there. And it's very strange as an artist to be thrown into those politics because you know it. Like for example, they it's like uh, a lot of um, bars. We call them bars. I don't know how you call them in um, you know housing housing that's really tall and square. I don't know how you call them. They. They, or they, they destroyed one, and in the middle, they made an artist residency <laughs> in the middle of like so many others. And they're, they're making this space available for artists to go work with the community in the, the worst possible, con the strangest possible c conditions, as opposed to getting an apartment inside one of those buildings and if that's what they want to do. But anyway, those are that's that's this year's problem last last time was a uh, evento and evento they did every they had a lot of social practice they decided to do a biennale with so much social practice and they got all those artists from norway from everywhere around the world to come and do social practice in a town where there's already active artists that are working uh, with uh, all sorts of nonprofits, and that just that just was just a failure and then they had to shut it down. Um, Pistoletto was the curator of the last one and he pocketed half the money before he did anything and he wanted the local artists to work for free and feel gratified for working for him. Was it uh, his third paradise or something like that? Or? Uh, his third paradise or third, it's his, he's working now with his weird project on the shape of the infinity i know no no it was in 2011. so suzanne you go to the conclusion d'accord okay well last piece it's uh in bordeaux so bordeaux was a it's a walk it's an artist walk and we're uh, supposed to work with those parks we do have like specific places we have to work with and I decided to uh, work on the trees that were brought back during the triangular commerce. So it will be a strange walk that talks about that past of France, which is 
very problematic in that town. They just opened a museum of the slave trade in 2009. The mayor didn't go to the opening, so it's very hot uh, history still. So we've identified trees that were important during that time. So all of these documents are in relation to plant importation and Jardiland, of course, because they're the new importers. So th this is a, a map that's uh, double-sided, that's printed and given out during the walk that's happening next week. Uh. <laughs> Thank you very much.